Okay, it's one o'clock. We'll get the show on the road here. My name is Jim Banky. I'm with RACO. I'd like to thank everybody for attending uh, today's webinar. Uh, as we get through the, as we go through the webinar here, if you would be kind enough to type in your questions, and then we will get to your questions at the end of the presentation. Today's speaker is Mr. Ken Solon. He is a GE Measurement and Control Moisture and Gas Instrumentation Product Specialist. His 29-year career in instrumentation and controls includes working as an analytical chemist, sales engineer, and product manager for chilled mirror and laser-based analyzers. Ken has served as an instructor and presenter and has presented several papers in the field of moisture and humidity measurement. He holds a degree from Kingsborough College and is a member of ISA, ISHM, AGA, ASHRAE, and NCSL. We welcome Ken back as a webinar speaker and thank him for his expertise and time today. Ken, it's up to you. Well, thank you, Jim, and uh, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to uh, log in and phone in to today's webinar. Uh, the subject matter is aluminum oxide sensors for trace moisture. Um, aluminum oxide sensors are considered the industrial workhorse of uh, trace moisture measurement. And uh, I can preface by saying that on Earth, on planet Earth, uh, we're of course surrounded by water. Water is essential for life. In fact, uh, the human body with something like 75% water, and much of the Earth's surface is, of course, covered in water, the seas, rivers, lakes, and so on. And the atmosphere contains a lot of water vapor in it. But there are many industrial processes where even minute amount of water uh, measured in the uh, parts per thousand or parts per million or even down to parts per billion uh, is too much water for that process. It's a contaminant in, in many industrial and uh, chemical processes. So the first thing we should uh, say about the sensor is it has a very wide dynamic range. Um, it covers a dew point measurement from negative 110 degrees C dew point to plus 20 degree dew point. And if we were to convert that dew point at atmospheric pressure to a volume ratio in parts per million by volume, uh, saying that one part per million means that there's one water molecule for a million other surrounding uh, gas molecules, uh, we would see that that range covers about 1.6 part per billion to about 24,000 part per million by, by volume. So that's a, a full ratio that the sensor covers of almost uh, 15 million. Uh, so you have a, essentially a turndown ratio of about 15 million. The principle in the way this sensor works is that you have a matrix uh, that absorbs the water in the vapor phase. And uh, that matrix acts like a capacitor. So water itself is a polar molecule. It has a, a positive side to it and a negative. And as that water gets into the capacitance field, it changes the uh, capacitance. And the way our sensor is structured is we essentially count the charge density, and that's directly related to the concentration of water surrounding it. If we were to look at the, the sensor as a cutaway under a microscope, the base structure is made out of aluminum, and we just use pure aluminum. Then we have a, a coating which is anodized on of aluminum oxide. Then we have a very thin gold layer uh, coating on top of that. Uh, the gold is porous, and gold is a very large uh, molecule. If we were to just make an example here, the gold would be about the size of a beach ball, and the water molecule would be about the size of a grain of sand. So because the beach balls have lots of spaces between it. The sand can pour through and get into the superstructure, which is the sensor. The aluminum oxide is also very porous. And each of those pores 
acts as a parallel capacitor. And when you put capacitors in parallel, you add them together. Uh, so on a relative scale, uh, air or nonpolar organic liquids uh, have a dielectric constant of about 1. And water has 80 times the dielectric strength. So as those pores fill with uh, water vapor, uh, the, the capacitance changes. And again, as, as more water absorbs into the superstructure, we're essentially counting the number of water molecules that absorb in. And we measure that as the capacitance change. We excite these sensors with a very low level AC excitation at a fixed frequency. And we measure the capacitance or the total impedance in terms of the impedance. And, and that impedance uh, gives us a function with respect to the amount of water that's absorbed into the sensor. This is what the, the sensor uh, looks like. Uh, it has a threaded fitting, which is a, a three-quarter straight thread with an O-ring seal. And that fitting enables us to install it at pretty high pressures. We can get a line seal up to 5,000 uh, PSIG. And there's an O-ring that seals that in place. Uh, we also ha have uh, the aluminum substrate. with, And that block that you see there is the aluminum oxide, which is overcoated with gold. The, the gold is so thin that it appears black. And then there is a, a gold armature on top of that. Now, this was our design up until about 2012. And we, uh, after 2012, we changed the design. But I wanted to just show this as the historical sensor, as uh, many people might open their probes that they have in the field, look inside and see this, this sensor inside of it. We can also couple that sensor with a temperature sensor. And temperature is needed to measure derived parameters uh, from the fundamental moisture measured in dew point, as well as pressure. Pressure is needed to convert over to, for example, parts per million by volume. We, we measure the dew point. That gives us the partial pressure of water. And if we divide that by the total pressure, we get the volume ratio. So those are the two parameters that we see quite often in trace moisture. We either see dew point or we typically see parts per million by volume. Uh, after 2012, we went to a silicon substrate design where we make the sensor on a wafer and by coating the wafer with uh, the aluminum oxide layer then an overcoating of gold, we're able to make many of these sensors on a standard wafer and then slice up the wafer and mount these uh, into our probe assembly. Uh, the wafer technology produces very repeatable sensors and also gives us very good long-term stability and also gives us uh, better bonding and mechanical strength over the previous sensors. Now our sensors come in um, basically three different formats. The M series is an analog sensor. So you connect to that sensor via cable. And the analyzer that's connected to it, or the meter, will measure directly the impedance change of the sensor. Um, we can also couple that moisture sensor, again, with the pressure and temperature sensor. And that's called our 3F, I'm sorry, our TF sensor, or three function sensor. And uh, we can also have a digital version called the MIS. And what that has is an extra module in it. Uh, inside this black module is a uh, circuit that stores the calibration data and has some signal conditioning in there as well. So the idea behind this sensor is it's transmitting just ones and zeros back to the analyzer. And the calibration data is stored within the probe. That makes the probe plug and play. You just plug it into the analyzer cable, and it uploads its calibration data. With the analog sensors, uh, you have to enter the data into the analyzer. You're, you're given, when you purchase one of these sensors, you're given a table of dew point versus the impedance data. And that data is entered uh, into the analyzer. 
Now these sensors have very good accuracy. They're plus or minus two degrees dew point um, uh, below negative 65 C, and then uh, I'm sorry, above that, and then below negative 65, uh, the, the accuracy opens up to uh, three degrees C. We also equip them with uh, various shields. The R shield, as we call it, is a sintered metal protection, and the W shield uh, just has a hole in it. It's stainless steel. And that enables organic liquids to have intimate contact with the sensor. Uh, we would typically use those in organic uh, liquids. And I'll speak about the application for liquids a little bit later on. Now, these sensors um, have a very good wet-up response. You can think of the sensor as being a almost like a ceramic sponge. And just like a kitchen sponge, uh, a kitchen sponge will absorb a lot of water. And if you had a dry sponge sitting at your kitchen table, or sink rather, uh, you could just throw it in a sink of water and it would suck up water from the sink almost immediately. But it takes time to dry out that sponge. If you, you had to dry out a sponge, you would, of course, take it out of the sink. You'd probably have to squeeze it and then maybe leave it in the sunlight for a while and it would eventually dry back out. So this material, this aluminum oxide, has a high affinity for water, and it will suck up the water very rapidly. Here we show a comparative graph of the response on a step change from negative 60 to about zero dew point. Uh, I'm sorry, about negative 65 to zero dew point, and that occurred in about 20 seconds. And that was at a pretty low flow rate. That's only one standard cubic foot per hour inclusive of a six-foot sample line and valves and fittings. To go in the opposite direction, to dry down, it took a little bit longer or considerably longer. And you can see that initially uh, the dry down occurs pretty fast. We're looking at the, the green trace here is the aluminum oxide. And then it starts to sort of flatten out in terms of response. And it becomes a, a, a very small slope, as it were. In scientific terms, that's called an asymptote. But it, in, in other terms, you just refer to it as a response tail. And you can see that it's sort of now zooming in and matching the chill mirror as, we, as time goes on. So changing in the other direction, uh, a 90% step change took uh, 9 minutes and 20 seconds. But it would take um, almost a couple of hours to really get down to the final value. As you can see, this kind of sloping down. And that is, that is one of the um, properties of this type of sensor. It does take some time to dry out. But in many applications, you're running very dry levels, and you're looking for ingress or a malfunction of the system where the wet up is what you want it to alarm for very quickly. This is also another response time from one of our portable instruments. And, and what we have in this portable instrument is a, a predictive uh, algorithm. It's called our CER. The CER stands for Computer Enhanced Response. So again, this had a T90 from a step change of plus 7 to negative 75 dew point. And, and just to give you an idea of what that is in PPM, negative 75 is about one part per million. Uh, plus 7 is somewhere in the neighborhood of, of over 10,000 ppm. So that occurred in about 50 minutes. Now, using the same system with the CER, uh, we got the same response in one and a half minutes. And the reason we got that such a faster response is what this device does is it measures the rate of change and it effectively predicts where the sensor is going to end up. And that mathematical algorithm is actually very repeatable. Um, we're able to get the same step change in one and a half minutes only by using a, a predictive model from looking at the rate of change. Uh, this is particularly effective when you have a startup or a large step change. Uh, it's also advantageous to install uh, sensors at pressure because as we pressurize a gas, we also increase the dew point. Now we don't change the volume ratio just by compressing a gas. We will still have the same volume ratio. Now this uh, 
particular nomograph is in a publication that's downloadable from our website. It's a, it's a guide called uh, uh, Principles of Hygrometry that we, we offer just as a free download. And uh, what it shows essentially is that in this nomograph, if I connect any of the two lines with a straight edge, uh, the third line that it goes through is, is the derived, derived answer. So in this case, uh, we have one ppm at zero psig, and that's negative 76 dew point, and we have one ppm at 600 psig, and that's minus 49 dew point. So it, the first thing it tells us is that pr uh, dew point is a pressure-dependent parameter. As we increase the pressure, we increase the dew point, but our one ppm value didn't change. And the second thing it tells us is that it's much easier to get to negative 49 if we're drying a system down than it is to get to negative 76. So we'll get a faster stability or faster response to the 1 ppm reading by applying pressure to the sensor. And these sensors certainly are suitable for installing up to 5,000 uh, PSIG. So pressure can help us uh, improve the response of our sensor technology. And within our technology, we have a number of uh, transmitters and indicators, and we sort of map them out here in terms of a, a value map, as we call it, price versus performance and features. It's a, sort of if we were to look at this map in terms of direction, sort of in the southeast, we have the basic transmitter that's going to be in an enclosure and provide a linear 4 to 20 milliamp signal as well as a, a display. And uh, the, as we sort of go up to the northeast, uh, we're, we're adding more features in terms of data logging or uh, alarm relays and uh, the ability to measure in organic liquids and portability as well as multi-channel um, analyzers. We have our Moisture IQ analyzer that can measure up to six sensors simultaneously. So there you have a multi-parameter and multi-channel um, analyzer. Just uh, some specs on the transmitter, which is a, a common solution. Uh, these are just in a casted header. They're explosion proof. And we really have two varieties here. We have a stainless steel insertion probe that might be put into ductwork or in a plenum. And then we have a flow-through cell, which uh, you would normally connect to compressed air. And that flow-through cell has a built-in filter and an optional orifice to maintain uh, the flow. That's called our MMY or DuPro series. And this is just a cutaway of that unit in terms of its flow cell. So here we just see the uh, sintered disk, which is the filter. There might be an inlet orifice to restrict the flow, and there might be an outlet orifice to maintain the back pressure depending on the application. But if we put an orifice on the outlet, typically at 100 PSIG, we'll maintain about 1.5 standard cubic feet per hour flow and maintain a nice flow through the system. So this, this makes a nice compact system that'll give you a localized display and put out a 4 to 20 milliamp signal that would be connected into your plant-wide monitoring system or controller. Our Hygro Pro uh, has some more features in terms of a transmitter. It's also loop powered. I like to call this one our mini moisture analyzer because it has a lot of features that only bigger console units have. It has a display that will give you up to three parameters. And it has more computational ability because it has a built-in pressure and temperature sensor, so it can do the part per million by volume or weight. Uh, typically by weight is when we're looking at moisture in a liquid. It can do absolute humidity and mass of the water over volume. Uh, uh, one of those that is commonly used in natural gas is pounds per million cubic feet. And this has the ability to uh, monitor uh, moisture in organic uh, liquids. And the way you do that is you program in solubility data into it. 
Uh, it also is uh, equipped for use in a hazardous zone by wiring it through an intrinsic safety barrier. And one of the nice things about this is that it's a, it uses a plug-and-play probe, so the probe is easily field interchangeable. The electronics for this probe stores the calibration data, and whenever the unit is powered, the data is automatically uploaded into the sort of mini analyzer here. And you can stock a spare probe and rotate those in and out of service. So with these, with these smart probes, there's no possibility of entering the wrong calibration data or mixing up probes. The calibration data is embedded into the probe. Our DUIQ is an is a eighth-in panel meter, um, and it uses a digital probe as well. It has a display as well as relays that are programmable. So you can set those relays to alarm at preset values. Uh, we have some customers that use those to engage, for example, a heating cycle or a regeneration cycle or turn on a purge gas if things get too wet. Uh, but they can just be used for alarms as well. In addition to the relays, of course, there is a, an analog output. There's a linear 4 to 20 milliamp signal that's uh, programmable. And this unit is also equipped with a 2 gigabyte data logger. And, you know, back in the, in the olden days, I thought 2 gigabytes was a lot of data, but uh, today 2 gigabytes is, is, is on a little uh, mini micro card, I should call it. So it, it's, it's amazing how much data can be stored on um, a small amount of space uh, today. And that's just a picture of the unit connected to the probe, and that would be inserted into a, a flow cell where the gas would flow through across the sensor. That's, that's that little micro card. So with that micro card, two gigabytes stores about uh, a couple of years worth of data if you sample that one minute interval. It would probably store about 10 years worth of data. Um, and with, it has the ability to just record the data in a ASCII format, ASCII 2 format. And then you can take that mini card out or the micro card out, put it into a PC, and save the data, to, for example, into Excel. So here's a graph of just a, a dry down response where we recorded the data, uh, dumped it into Excel, and then we graphed it in Excel. And a lot of times when you're trying to troubleshoot systems or analyze systems, having that ability to record things on board uh, uh, does a lot for you. Um, I personally have a bit of problem just looking at tables of numbers, but if I can take those same numbers and graph them, uh, to me, I, I, I get a better view of the data. I, I, I understand it better. I'm more of a graphic person than a, a numbers person. Uh, our portables are used for spot checking. Uh, our first one is the MMY245 portable uh, analyzer, and that has a sensor built into it, and it also has this arm on it. Um, uh, that arm uh, is essentially a valve, so when the sensor is not in use, the sensor is surrounded by desiccant, and that keeps the sensor dry. So by pre-drying the sensor, we get a faster response to trace levels, to very dry levels, because rather than starting from a wet point, the sensor is already pre-dried. And uh, that dryness is approximately negative 60 degree C dew point, or about 10 part per million. This unit operates on standard uh, D-cell batteries. So um, you can use it in an uh, industrial plant and not have to worry about getting any kind of special power supply. Uh, there we just see a sort of a diagram of sampling off of a compressed air line by sampling through a coalescing filter. If you notice, there's a, a valve here that drains the coalescing filter. That drains any oils or aerosols that come out of the coalescing filter. It also increases the volume through the sample line, and that helps to sweep 
uh, the contamination off the dirty side of the filter. So that clean gas then flows through and we're able to um, measure the pressure as well as regulate the flow. Uh, a sample system, even this simple, should always be used. One of the things that is very helpful is this isolation valve. If you need to connect to the system, it's quite easy to do so. You don't have to shut down the, the process or the compressed air system. You should always have a means of isolating your analyzer away from the system without having to shut it down. And then the rest of this is just signal or sample conditioning by filtration and adjusting the flow and pressure. Our PM880 is a, also another portable. Uh, it's a little bit different in that this unit can store the data from multiple sensors. So here, one of the uh, scenarios is that you can uh, install sensors in place and then just plug into those sensors that are already in place. It also has a bit more computational power as well as the internal data logger. Uh, this unit can display up to four parameters. It also has a graphical display that gives you an ongoing graph. And it can store up to 60 data files. So you can store the data from up to, let's say, 60 probes and just walk around and plug into those probes. Or you can store any combination of uh, uh, save data that you record from the process. This unit also has the CER, or computerized enhanced response, to give you a quicker dry down, as, as we discussed earlier. Our multi-channel analyzer is the Moisture IQ, and that has a color touch screen. We have it in both bench top as well as wall-mounted and explosion-proof units. Uh, you can configure this unit to support up to six channels, and each channel supports a sensor. So if you have uh, multiple measurement points in a plant, it, it often becomes more economical to go to a multi-channel analyzer than six individual analyzers, as an example. Uh, this unit will also connect up to the Delta F uh, oxygen cells, and it also has 12, up to 12 4 to 20 milliamp process input. So any process input that's in a 4 to 20 format can be sent into this unit, and this unit can display the readings uh, directly in engineering units. It also has the ability to do data logging and uh, has the built-in intrinsic safety barriers that enable you to mount this unit in the safe zone, yet have the sensors out in the uh, hazardous area. And one of the things I like about this is that it also has an Ethernet uh, port and with the supplied uh, VNC viewer, it's called, you can operate this remotely. So I can, uh, for example, have a process running in Chicago, but I could be here in Boston. And as long as I, I can get through your firewall, I'll be able to pull up your unit on a remote screen and have full access to it and be able to download the data and make changes and so forth. Of course, um, uh, anything, anything in a like that is usually uh, blocked by a, fire, a company's firewall, but it, internally you would be able to do that in, in your own network. And these are just some pictures of the, the NEMA 4 and the explosion-proof version. Uh, both of these are touchscreen displays, even though the, the explosion-proof is in this sort of heavy uh, casted enclosure. You still program it just by tapping um, the front panel as you would a uh, an iPhone or a, uh, a Garmin GPS or what have you. Again, uh, one of the things that I really like about these instruments is the ability to self-record. Uh, I think that's a, a really great feature. You know, again, I'm a very sort of graphic oriented person when it comes to looking at data, so with this, uh, here's an example of just using that to record six parameters. It was actually uh, three moisture probes, a chilled mirror reference standard, uh, a, a transmitter, and a laser-based uh, hygrometer that we may call the Aurora. And we, we saw that uh, they all sort of merged together after uh, overnight. 
and there's sort of a spread there of the different instruments. Um, the sort of purple line is the, the reference standard, the Optica. Now, uh, any measurement is only as good as the ability to calibrate uh, the sensor, and aluminum oxide sensors do drift over time. If they're stored in a, a clean, dry, or applied to a clean, dry, inert gas, such as nitrogen or compressed air, the average drift on uh, these sensors is less than 2 degrees dew point per year, 2 degrees Celsius per year. Uh, but in, in many industries, you have contaminants. And no matter how well you filter a sensor, uh, you're still susceptible to depositing contaminants or corrosive or reactive gases onto the sensor. So there's a need to do calibrations. And what we've done is to invest in developing automated uh, calibration systems that are NIST traceable. So in the architecture of our design, it's a very modular approach. We have a reference standard, which is the chilled mirror. Uh, we take dry nitrogen boil off. We saturate a fraction of it to give us a known level of moisture. And then we dilute that using mass flow control valves. In this chassis, there's a, a bank of mass flow control valves. And uh, that gas is then flowed across the sensors. Uh, the complete calibration process actually takes about a week. The first step is drying everything out for two days. And that's all reference to a NIST traceable chilled mirror. The complete system is uh, fully automated once we rack up these units and enter the serial numbers. And even there, we have barcode readers to do that. Uh, the technician just hits start and walks away from the system when he comes back. A week later, all of the data is stored uh, for each of these probes. And in fact, you as a customer have access to that data. You can get that data at any time. It, the data is published online. You just have to register, enter the serial number of your probe, and you'll be able to download the calibration data for it. Uh, this is just some more pictures of the systems. Uh, we have five of these banks. In our facility in Boston, we also have banks in Shannon, Ireland, as well as other countries, uh, including Japan, China, Australia, um, the Middle East, and uh, South America. Now, when you get one of these probes, you're given a table of MH versus dew point. And MH is just our nomenclature for the impedance value, the raw value. And if you have an analog probe, you have to enter this 14-point table into the analyzer. If you have a digital probe, you're still given this data, but you don't have to enter the data. The data is automatically uploaded when you plug the probe in. Anytime you put a new probe in, you have to enter the new set of data. Or if you send your probe back for calibration, when you get it back, you have to enter the new set of data if it's uh, the analog style probe. If we were just to take that data and graph it out, this is the kind of response we'd get. If you took those 14 points, uh, the y value is the, really the impedance, and uh, the x value is the dew point. So essentially, our meters or analyzers measure the impedance. And once it gets that numeric value, let's say if we had an impedance equivalent to 0.5 here, we would just follow it over to the lookup table and down to the prevailing dew point. And that's really the equation that governs this uh, shape of the curve. It's a, a polynomial. Now over time, as I mentioned, sensors do drift. Here's an example of a customer sensor that he didn't have the sensor calibrated for five years. He calibrated it originally in 2011, in September of 2011, and uh, sent it back for calibration in uh, June of 2015. So we can see that the sensor did drift, but more so on the upper end than the lower end. So the lower end stayed pretty stable even after five years, but he did see some progressive drift up on the upper end. 
And that sensor is still usable, but the next time you get that sensor back, instead of entering the data from sort of the green line, um, the, the blue line, you would enter the data corresponding to the green line. You could also determine how much the sensor drifted at a given dew point. So at negative 20 C, we can see the difference uh, of how much that sensor drifted. And we can also give you the before and after data that shows you how much that sensor drifted in terms of dew point. So uh, one of the most important applications that we encounter is compressed air. And of course, compressed air is, is a source of energy. Uh, and it's, it's a safe source that can be used in a lot of different applications, like, uh, example, pneumatic tools. Pneumatic tools can be used in a, a hazardous environment. They can also get a lot of wear and tear. We all remember going to our local tire place where they use uh, an impact wrench to take the tires off. So when they're repeating taking those lug nuts on and off every day for hundreds of cars, it's more effective to use a pneumatic tool than even an electric or a hand tool. Uh, so it's, it's a way of transmitting power for all sorts of different applications. Of course, if we took all of the gas in compressed air, we're squeezing it into a, a smaller space, essentially. So in this example, if we wanted to produce 100 PSI G, uh, we would have to take all of the gas in about 8 cubic feet and compress it into 1. So that's about an 8 to 1 compression ratio to get us the 100 PSIG. And all of the contamination and all of the gas is now concentrated in a, small, a smaller space. So when we concentrate the contaminants and the water into that smaller space, we increase the dew point. There's more of a propensity for the water to condense out in the compressed uh, situation. So that, that gas has to be dried uh, to meet standards to prevent water from condensing out. In a, in a typical plant, uh, you can think of compressed air as being the fourth or fifth utility, uh, electricity, steam, water, and natural gas, and compressed air are probably the five most uh, used utilities. Out of all of those, compressed air is the most expensive. 7% of the total energy consumption in the U.S. is used to produce compressed air, and it costs about 15 cents to 30 cents per thousand cubic foot to compress the air up to about 100 pounds, and that's prior to even drying it. Once you dry it, it's going to cost more. So in a typical plant, you'll have a drying train, which consists of the first phase of typically using a refrigeration dryer. This is where the compressed air passes across chilled coils. And typically those coils have what we call an approach temperature of about 35 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the gas coming out of that or the air coming out of that is very usable for a lot of applications, maybe tool applications or what have you. We can dry the gas further by typically going through a desiccant dryer to get it down to dew points between negative 40 to negative 140, depending on the specification. So dollar for dollar, the refrigeration system is move, removing more water per pound than the desiccant system, but the de desiccant system is more costly. And the reason the desiccant system is more costly, it takes money to regenerate or energy to regenerate the spent desiccant. We'll look at this a little bit further. Uh, this is just a classification for compressed air, air ISO 8573, and, and it just gives uh, you build up a, a classification. So there's an example of class 1 to 1. Class 1, 1, 1 would be the most expensive because it, it's the cleanest. It's the lowest dew point and has the least amount of oil in it. Uh, there are a number of other standards as well. Um, here is a typical system that we would put together for compressed air. We would have an inlet isolation valve to isolate the system. We'd have a filter, our transmitter, where the gas flows through it, a pressure gauge, and a rotor meter to tell us how much gas we're metering out. 
and we'll typically vent that to the atmosphere. Now notice anything behind this valve is still at pressure. And in certain cases where the compressed air has aerosols or particulate, we'll employ a coalescing filter to trap the aerosols and remove that entrained uh, liquid, be it oil or be it water or other contaminants that carry over. We can also package our moisture IQ, I'm, I'm sorry, our dew IQ in an enclosure. This is a very popular package that we offer a, a specialized price on. If you, if you bought the components of these separately, it'd be about double the price of the package. And uh, here it's just a turnkey system where you have everything built into uh, one panel in an enclosure that you can uh, essentially mount to the wall. Uh, so it's just another example of um, some of the packaging that we do. So in uh, in drying, uh, the desiccant dryer is, is the workhorse of getting moisture out. You usually notice that there are two columns. One column is online, and inside of that is uh, desiccant material, which is uh, alumina or molecular sieve, but basically a solid material that will absorb the water. And as that absorbs a certain amount of water, it starts to become saturated. So there's usually an offline column that's being regenerated by heat or a combination of depressurizing the dry air you just produced to back through the offline column. The result of this is to reproduce a dew point of negative 40 degrees using what we call a heatless or pressure swing dryer. We're consuming about 15 percent of the compressed air. So if we're only if our compressor is producing 100 cubic feet, we really only have effectively 85 cubic feet that we can use out of that because 15 of them are used to regenerate. And again, compressed air is the most expensive utility, so this is rather costly. So it's very important to monitor that system. In this case, uh, this is actually a dryer within our plant. There's a dew point monitor built right into the chassis, and that dew point monitor also functions to switch the columns when we start to see moisture breakthrough. To produce lower dew points, you have to use even more compressed air. Now, you can, you can reduce the amount of compressed air used by applying heat, by uh, installing electrical or even gas-fired heaters in these columns. But of course, heat doesn't come for free. You have to get the heat energy from somewhere as well. Same principle on a, a wheel desiccant dryer. Uh, these are used for larger volumes, let's say in uh, rooms or uh, that have to be really dry. So here we have a wheel that's rotating slowly, and one section of the wheel is being reactivated, being back purged. So it takes heat energy to do that. Uh, but the same principle applies. You you have an online section of the dryer, and then you have an offline section that's being regenerated. Another type of dryer is a membrane dryer, and this is really based on pore size and uh, sometimes on polarity. But the, on, on this type of dryer, the pore size is small enough to uh, not allow nitrogen to permeate through. But water, CO2, and oxygen permeates through because they're smaller molecules. Uh, this does consume air, though. It, you, you have to use about 20% of your compressed air to back purge it to drive the differential out of it. So you have to have a differential pressure to drive the water that is uh, coming out of it. So you don't get something for nothing. It, this, although this has no moving parts, uh, it still is going to use about 20 percent of your dried compressed air that you produce. Now it is very useful in terms of a point of use device. Like for example, if you had air in a plant dried by refrigeration, you could put one of these at the paint shop. And it could be the final element for uh, drying the compressed air used for spray painting, as an example. So uh, there's still a lot of industrial uses for this, but you're gonna, you're gonna, the cost per unit of dry air is going to be a little bit higher with membrane dryers. Uh, here's just an example of uh, using that uh, 
to produce ozone, uh, you have to have uh, your gas very dry. So what they're doing here is they're producing dry air and enriching that with oxygen. And as that flows through an arcing element called a corona, uh, O3 ozone is produced. But you can see from the graph, as the dew point goes up, the amount of ozone you produce rapidly starts to decrease. So they have to have pretty dry air, certainly less than negative 60 is the spec we see a lot on uh, ozone. Ozone is being used quite a bit as a substitute for chlorine. Uh, so for example, in swimming pools, you can use uh, chlorine instead of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, you can use ozone instead of uh, chlorine. Likewise for drying plastics, uh, uh, if you think of a plastics material, any moisture absorbed in that resin under pressure and temperature will expand into steam and cause imperfections, bubbles, or splay, as it's called, uh, into the final product. And this is a, a unit on an uh, injection molding machine, maybe making CDs or something like that. Uh, here's a case study. Uh, the U.S. Navy uses these on submarines. Of course, these submarines go out for months at a time, and they have a lot of pneumatic controls. In fact, the periscope, as you see the, the officer there kind of giving a tour to a kid, um, is pneumatically actuated, so they have to make sure that their dew points are below a certain level. So they have to be able to take these things on board. They like the fact that it's battery operated and has the fast response. Um, Engelhard is a company that makes uh, ozone to bleach Georgia clay. Georgia clay, of course, as we know from baseball, you know, the diamond is red, the clay around the diamond, and to produce the white china that we use from that Georgia clay or china clay, uh, we have to bleach it. So rather than using chlorine, uh, they use uh, ozone. Uh, another big application for us is air separation. We can get pure gases of uh, mainly nitrogen, argon, and oxygen from separating those out of air. Air, of course, is a mixture of gases, and this is sort of the reverse of distillation, where in distillation we start with a liquid, we heat the liquid, and we separate the different components at different temperatures. Well, here we start with gases, and as we chill them down to very low temperatures, um, nitrogen, argon, and oxygen, and CO2, and so forth, separate at, at different temperatures. And we have to make sure that we remove all of the water, or ice will form on our uh, coal box or in our uh, cryo heat exchanger. I'm not going to read through all of this, but uh, the, the, the takeaway is that it's a very important parameter in uh, natural gas. Uh, natural gas has to be under a certain level because we don't want uh, uh, water to combine with acid gases to form corrosion. We can also form ice in the pipeline that can block the pipeline. Here we actually see a picture of a big slug of ice or hydrate that was pulled out of uh, or pigged out of a line. So for custody transfer uh, in the U.S., the interstate uh, commerce tariff, as it were, is about seven pounds per million cubic feet, that's equal to about negative 39 uh, degrees dew point in degree C. That's about 152 part per million. So uh, the natural gas you get delivered to your home is relatively dry. That's, and, and, and again, uh, techniques have to be applied to remove that. The techniques include contactors that use triethylene glycol. In making liquid natural gas, we have to take it down using absorption dryers, and they're typically taking it down to very, very dry levels, less than one part per million, again, because we don't want ice forming in these cryogenic heat exchangers. So much like uh, your refrigerator at home is much less efficient when you form a lot of ice on the freezer. In, in the olden days, before they had frost-free refrigerators, we used to have to shut down our refrigerators and literally melt them out, particularly in the summertime, to get all the frost off of it. And then the, the, we could put more food in, and it became more efficient. The same principle really applies here. Uh, 
Another application we run across is in power plants, uh, hydrogen-cooled electric generators. The hydrogen is used to take heat away from the heat-forming generator. Hydrogen is the most thermally conductive gas, and it's also the lightest gas, so it produces the less resistance against spinning the turbine. So uh, we have to dry that out completely. Again, they're looking for part per million levels or below uh, in this application. It's a very popular one for us because we also measure hydrogen uh, as well in these applications. Uh, in switchgear, SF6 or sulfur hexafluoride is an insulating gas. Uh, the theory behind it is it, it's, it quenches arc. So when a big contactor in an electrical closure closes, the sulfur hexafluoride quenches that arc. It prevents it from happening. And literally what happens is the molecule blows apart. If there's any water, the water combines with fluorine to form hydrofluoric acid, which is very corrosive. So here's an example where they would generally put the probe inside of the contactor and use a portable just to spot check it. Um, the, the probe stays permanently there because we don't want to waste any of the gas. SF6 is a very expensive gas. In metal heat treating, uh, you're creating atmospheres to impart certain properties into the metal. Uh, we're both measuring the feed gases going into the furnace as well as the furnace atmospheres themselves. Uh, the atmospheres themselves uh, are very, let's say, dirty environments. They have a lot of metallic particulates, sometimes acid gases. So we have to have a very elaborate sampling system. Uh, one of the most effective sampling systems is an oil bath where we literally bubble uh, the sample through a container of oil. We actually just use uh, 5W30 motor oil, and just like the motor oil in your car, it traps the particulate material and becomes darker and darker. Eventually, you have to change the oil, but it works uh, very effectively in these furnace applications. Here's a panel of uh, uh, that system with a moisture, a uh, oxygen, and a hydrogen monitor all in one turnkey sampling system and chassis. And these are just a couple of case studies. Uh, Burns Harbor, Indiana, Arcelor Middle produces high strength steel. And in those applications, it's annealing and galvanizing. They have atmosphere control furnaces with uh, nitrogen and hydrogen. Hydrogen is a scavenger for oxygen, so it'll bright anneal uh, materials. It'll pull off oxides off of uh, uh, metal surfaces and so forth. U.S. Steel is along the same lines. And then we get into food grade. Um, moisture is a parameter. Uh, there's a big uh, episode uh, in Coca-Cola where they had contamination in, in, in Coca-Cola. So they've got pretty stringent uh, parameters for all of these parameters. Of course, moisture is one of them. They have to have under 20 ppm in the carbon dioxide used to make our soft drinks fizzy. Uh, CO2 is also used in uh, dough making as well as in beer making and other applications. Beer making, that's one of my favorite subjects. Um, um, I'm not going to call out a specific brewery, but some of the large-scale breweries um, actually remove the CO2 after uh, the fermentation process. And this is done for high-speed bottling. So uh, in order to fill the bottles without foaming up, um, the beer bottles are filled with flat beer, and then the CO2 is added at the end to give it the fizziness, but that CO2 has to be dried uh, prior, prior to refilling. Uh, synthetic fibers, uh, we think of nylon or polyester. It's a really a molten synthetic that's drawn through these spinnerets and forms the fiber. Kelvar is an example of that, as well as uh, even surgical sutures, so dry gas or dry air is purged across this nozzle to fuse or quench, uh, to basically to turn the molten material into a solid, and that has to happen very quickly with uh, very dry uh, gas to do that. So you, you wouldn't be able to make synthetic fibers um, without the use of uh, uh, dry gases to do that. 
Now, I always like to put this slide out there because what today doesn't use the battery? You know, just about every everything uh, portable uses a battery in uh, your notebook computer, your cell phone, uh, what have you. And of course, lithium batteries. Lithium is uh, uh, will react with water uh, violently to even explode. Uh, in fact, when you go on an airplane today, they warn you if you have any lithium-ion batteries, you're just not supposed to put them in the luggage. You're supposed to take them on with you. So these are processed in very dry rooms, negative 60 dew point. In fact, if you walk into those rooms, your voice changes. You can feel that you're getting very thirsty even after a small amount of time. So uh, our sensors are used to monitor that operation. Uh, telecommunications, uh, we, we rely on our cell phones, and that's in the microwave spectrum. To generate the microwaves, uh, you have to have waveguides. And of course, as you know, one of the ways of cooking food or heating food is to put it in a microwave oven. And the reason the food cooks is the microwaves attenuate or attenuated by the water molecule. In other words, as you apply microwaves to water, the molecule vibrates and produces heat. Uh, that's good for cooking food, but uh, for telecommunications, it's going to consume all of your signal. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to get any pickup on your cell phone, so they have to purge these uh, waveguides with, with dry gases. And there you see the dual tower uh, desic and dryer. It's a very small system, but yet it's very important to uh, enable effective telecommunications today. In glove boxes, there's all sorts of operations in pharmaceutical and in, uh, instrumentation and in electronics. It's basically creating a micro environment, and many of these environments have to be purged or maintained dry. Uh, our sensor has the ability to measure moisture in organic liquids, and that might even be the subject of a whole other seminar, but uh, we can directly install our sensor in many organic liquids by a principle called Henry's Law. And uh, there we saw, sort of see a picture of a tech sergeant drawing a sample from an aircraft, and he's going to have to take that back to the lab to run what's called a Carl Fisher on it. With, it. with our method, you're directly able to measure the moisture content online by having knowledge of the solubility. Um, there's some pretty good papers on our website as well on this subject. So one of the best ways, of course, to get information on our products and applications is to go to our website, which is uh, listed there. I encourage you to download uh, our basic hygrometry principles guidebook. It has a lot of good information in there. And uh, with that, um, uh, my contact information is there if you want to get a hold of me. And uh, I know we went through quite a bit quickly, but we certainly would like to open it up for questions. Thanks, Ken. That was uh, very informative, very good. We appreciate that. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, if anything else comes to mind by anybody, please feel free to go ahead and type them in. Uh, Ken, we have a question here. How often should you calibrate the probes? Uh, the, the, the cycle of calibrating probes is like the 3,000 mile oil change. Our recommendation is at least every 12 months for most applications. Uh, there are some applications, uh, for example, if you're exposing the sensor to chlorine or reactive gases where we want to increase the frequency to every three months or even sometimes every six months. But I would say that the de facto standard is uh, once every 12 months. Okay. Uh, another quick one here. What happens when you lose calibration data from the probe? Well, if, if uh, on our digital probes, they're embedded, so uh, they're never going to lose the calibration. But on our analog probes, if, if you happen to lose your calibration data sheet, um, you can just go to our website and register. Once you register, you'll be able to put in the serial number, and you'll be able to get a copy of the last calibration. Uh, or you can ask your local representative, like Rayco, to do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want to take the trouble to go on. But I, I would encourage you to register the probes, because you could also go in and schedule a reminder of, 
uh, when you would like to get a reminder to how your probe's recalibrated. Okay, and I think we're getting close. We're getting it just hit about an hour here, so we'll take one more last question here and uh, call it quits. How does pressure affect dew point? Well, we uh, we can think of air or gas as being like a sponge, and the dew point is the temperature at which water starts to convert or condense from the gas phase to liquid. So as you squeeze things together, in order to convert to liquid, water molecules have to find each other, sort of collide with each other and stick, and they get heavier and drop out. So by squeezing them closer and closer together under pressure, you're getting more collisions and therefore getting more water to condense out. So if you think of air as being like a sponge, think of a moist sponge, and if you squeeze the sponge in your hand, whatever like residual water is in the sponge would squeeze out of the sponge. Or it's like wringing out clothing, you know, there might be some moisture in the clothing, and when you wring the clothing or squeeze that sponge, you're getting the last remaining amount of water by squeezing it. So water, incre increasing the pressure always increases the dew point. And that's an important thing to remember whenever you're using a portable to check an online monitor. If you want to make sure that both instruments are at the same pressure, if your portable instrument is at a lower pressure, you're going to get a lower dew point than the online measurement, even though both might be correct. Okay. Again, thank you very much, Ken, for taking time uh, out of your day to uh, put this webinar out. Thank you, everybody, for uh, attending. I'd also like to remind uh, the audience that we will have this presentation on our website probably by Friday of this week, maybe Monday. But uh, if you do want to go back and review or pass it along to anybody, it can be found at Raco.com. Uh, otherwise, else, thanks again, Ken. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Appreciate your time.